World War III is a game with immense abundance and depth when it comes to gear and customization, which can be overwhelming to new players and sometimes even be hard to get right for veterans alike when it comes to the details. That's why I've created this guide that covers everything you need to know from basics to details so that you can set up your loadouts in ways that fully enable you to always be performing at your best. I'm Firefly. Welcome or welcome back to my channel, and thank you for checking out my comprehensive guide to loadouts and customization in World War III. The best way out there to get a head start in terms of gear is to take advantage of default blueprints which can give you early access to a lot of good attachments. As you earn XP and level up your account, you'll unlock new weapons and strikes by themselves, but every 5 or so levels, you will also unlock a new default loadout for both your character and your strikes. These default loadouts are super valuable because the guns and vehicles in these loadouts are blueprints, and they come with attachments that would otherwise be locked until you've leveled up that gun or vehicle to the required level, which in some cases can take a very long time. Most of these default blueprints are actually decent, and really will make the gun a lot better than it would be for a while if you were to start from scratch. They're not supposed to be the best attachments for the gun, of course, or else you'll have nothing left to grind for, but even a half-decent build takes away the frustration of having to grind the first few levels on a gun with iron sights and empty attachment slots, putting you at a disadvantage against everyone you fight. If you like some of the attachments but not others, you can actually take off attachments you don't want, and it'll even still be there afterwards in case you change your mind later. If you lost a default build because you swapped it out for something else, re-equipping the same weapon might not bring back the attachments, but you can get it back. Just open the loadout and click Reset to Default Loadout, and it's back. Something that many players don't know is that you can actually use any blueprint in more than one loadout. There's actually a way to save any default blueprint as a custom blueprint so that you can preserve it independent of the loadout slot and use it in any slots you want. I actually recommend doing this every time you unlock a new default, that way you make sure you never have to reset any of your loadouts to get the defaults back. Most of the blueprints only give you a little bit of momentum at the beginning of the grind to progress that gun, but considering how many guns you get blueprints for, and how the beginning is typically the hardest because that's when the gun is the worst, altogether they can still be quite valuable. And then there's at least a few blueprints that do actually come with very high level unlocks, so it's definitely worth paying attention to what you're being given. All of this applies to vehicles in your strike loadouts as well. The vehicles have customization just like the guns, and the default loadouts give you early access to upgrades. In fact, the T-72 main battle tank from the Knight loadout is perhaps the most extreme example of default blueprints offering value. As someone who uses vehicles extensively, I can tell you that the T-72 is currently one of the best vehicles in the game, and the only main battle tank worth your time to actually level up. And the blueprint from the Knight loadout comes with the anti-vehicle chassis armor. This chassis armor is not only one of the best things to run, it's also a level 34 unlock. It's the second last unlock for the entire vehicle, Vehicles in general are much harder to level up than guns because you gotta earn strike points to call them in in the first place before you can start spending time in them to rank them up. And on top of that, the T-72 is especially hard because it has a high cost and a long cooldown. So if you're someone who does use vehicles and you know to make use of this loadout, 
That chassis armor could be an advantage that lasts hundreds of hours into your time in World War III. So this I would definitely recommend saving. The other two attachments aren't that great. In fact, the turret is probably worse than the default option despite taking up an attachment slot. This here is more like what I would usually run. And then you just save it as a custom blueprint. Now that you know how to use default blueprints to get lots of attachments early, let's talk about the attachments themselves and how to build your gun in general. Starting with recoil, most people are probably going to want to prioritize horizontal recoil over vertical for the same two reasons you would want to do so in most other FPS games. Human targets are mostly vertical structures, they're much taller than they are wide, so horizontal recoil can more easily throw you off target than vertical, and vertical recoil only goes in one direction. Guns bounce upwards, they don't bounce downwards, or at least not in this game, but for horizontal recoil, guns do bounce left and right, which makes it inherently harder to control because you can't just compensate by moving your mouse in one direction, you have to keep switching. It's also worth mentioning that if you're having trouble with vertical recoil, it might be a good idea to increase your vertical mouse sensitivity before starting to build your guns for vertical recoil. Next up, let's briefly talk about lasers, and by that I mean mostly the ANPEQ-15. If a laser doesn't say gives away your position in the menu, it won't produce a beam that the enemy can see. So with that out of the way, it pretty much means that the ANPEQ-15 laser is excellent and is currently pretty much a no-brainer on almost every weapon that has it. This laser decreases ADS time by a huge 20% at the cost of some weapon swap time, which is irrelevant in most conventional loadouts where you'll never actually use your second weapon, which is usually just a pistol that fills the slot. So the Ampeg 15 is definitely something that you want to put on as soon as you unlock it in most cases. The only exceptions are perhaps SMGs and shotguns, which might benefit more from using another attachment in that slot, like a laser that improves hipfire accuracy. Also, the weapon swap time penalty might actually hurt a bit if you're using the SMG alongside an RPG, which is a very common loadout for people to run because the weight fits very well. So yeah, the Ampeg 15 is a pure positive on most weapons. Other than that, the hipfire lasers are also okay. I don't recommend running flashlights or laser flashlight combos. For now, there's too many caveats to how they work and they have large handling penalties. Moving on, I want to talk about the secondary ammo attachment slot as well. So yes, you can carry two types of ammo at the same time, but under the current implementation, it's mostly useless because there's very little actual benefit to doing so. I think the concept is pretty cool and this topic deserves a video of its own, but for now all you need to know is that running FMJ makes you spawn with an extra magazine worth of normal ammo, so this attachment slot is usually just a way to get more ammo. It's worth noting that the extra amount you get does scale with your magazine size, so if you have an assault rifle with a 75 round mag, you'll actually get 75 more rounds instead of just the regular 30. There's one weapon that's slightly different, and that's the Alpha, the last assault rifle. With the Alpha, you can do the same thing to spawn with more ammo, but you'll need to equip AP instead of FMJ because the Alpha is special and its default ammo type is actually AP. If you run anything other than AP on the Alpha, or anything other than FMJ on other weapons, you'll actually end up carrying two types of ammo at the same time, and you can only switch between them by holding the reload key. This is really inconvenient unless you're doing this with very large magazines because you only get one mag of the alternate ammo. I recommend against doing this period because as far as I can tell, the differences between different ammo types is barely noticeable, and when you combine this with the fact that you only get one mag, and that you have to hold down the reload key to switch ammo types, which might get you killed in a fight, it's probably better to spend that attachment slot on literally anything else. Lastly, about optics, here you absolutely should use what feels right to you. 
The one thing you should know though is that if you put more than one optic on the same gun, you'll get the combined ADS penalty from both optics and the resulting ADS time will apply to both optics. As in, if you have, say, a sniper rifle with a long range scope and a red dot sight on the side, switching to the red dot sight will not let you ADS any faster. The red dot sight will still provide you with a wider field of view, which can be beneficial at close range, but you will not get faster ADS. However, if you actually replace the long range scope by hot swapping it for a reflex sight using the backpack, you will actually get better ADS time. Now that we've covered building guns, let's talk about building the rest of the loadout besides your gun. Starting with armor, you should know that armor in World War 3 is very effective and you should almost always prioritize armor over mobility or better secondary weapons because that really is the way to go. Armor reduces incoming bullet damage depending on the penetration value of the ammo and the absorption value of the armor plate. The details deserve its own video, but for now, all you need to know is that the damage reduction you get, it depends on both what armor you're wearing and what ammo is hitting you. So that's armor, and now mobility. Mobility affects your movement speed for both walking and sprinting, and it affects the maximum duration of your tactical sprint. That's the fast sprint where your character raises the gun and sprints super fast, it affects how long you can do that for. You should also know that your guy's movement speed and tactical sprint duration doesn't change continuously for every block of weight you add to your loadout. There's actually only three tiers of mobility, low, medium, and high, and each one of these has a different movement speed and tack sprint duration. Within the same tier of mobility, your movement speed and tack sprint duration actually stays the same, even if the exact number of weight blocks is different. Next I'd like to briefly talk about supply packs. When you first start playing, you're naturally going to feel like running the medical pack on all of your loadouts, and that will serve you well for a while. The moment you unlock the first aid kit, aka the stim shot, in your backpack, I highly recommend running that together with the equipment pack instead. This will allow you to replenish health and armor without the help of a teammate, with the added bonus of being able to resupply grenades. It's a very effective combo and I highly recommend it. The ammo pack is not that useful on most loadouts since you'll never run out of ammo instantly like with health and armor. You could be running around with full health and armor and then get into a fight and barely win that and you suddenly went from not needing any health or armor to desperately needing both. Ammo doesn't run out in that fashion, you're not going to burn through all of your ammo in one fight, so when you start running low on ammo you're gonna see it coming and you can start searching for leftover ammo packs on the ground, asking teammates, or start moving towards one of those resupply stations which most maps have. I mostly recommend running ammo pack for launcher loadouts because launchers are the only weapons that do run out of ammo almost immediately. If you're running the RPG to take on a tank that's been bothering you, you only spawn with 3 shots. Even if you hit all 3 shots, most tanks can actually take way more than that, so you're gonna need to resupply. So the ammo pack is great for launchers. Last but not least, equipment. Every single one of these is actually quite useful in at least some situations, except maybe the impact grenade which is pretty bad in my experience. I won't waste time explaining what each of them do because if you've played any other FPS game, you know how these work. I recommend trying every single one of these as you unlock them so you know what options you have. Grenades and other consumable equipment in FPS games are often either extremely overpowered or fairly underwhelming and irrelevant. This game actually does it pretty well, same goes with most of the backpack ones. Equipment in general is probably another topic that deserves a video of its own. Finally, let's talk about the backpack, the goodie bag that gives you all kinds of goodies like the SPD reflex, the T2M offset, 
the combo suppressor, and the first aid kit, aka the stim shot. The backpack allows you to modify your loadout during gameplay. You bring up the menu by hitting the backpack keybind, and there you can make changes to the attachments on the gun you're holding or swap out to a second type of equipment. So you can run frag grenades and the stim shot at the same time, and this is how you switch between them in game. Or, if you're using a weapon with a long range scope and you need to fight someone up close, you can replace the scope with a reflex sight to make it more usable at close range and you'll get faster ADS while the reflex sight is equipped. Those are actually pretty much the only reasons right now to ever hot swap anything mid game. Hot swapping is not that useful as of right now, but don't be mistaken, the backpack itself still very much is. Most of the value offered by the backpack lies in the unique items themselves, and the free access you get to these items, unrelated from any limits like weight blocks or attachment slots. If you look at the equipment here, these are exclusive to the backpack. They don't actually show up in the main loadout menu, so the backpack is the only way you can get them, and at least a few of them are actually really good. The backpack attachments are also exclusive. You won't find them inside the customization menu of any weapon, and most of them are actually great. A few are actually among the best attachments in the game. They're also unlocked by player levels, which means once you unlock them, you can put them on any compatible weapon. You don't have to grind each weapon for each attachment like you do have to with normal attachments. And if that wasn't good enough, they also don't take up any attachment slots on your gun. Most of my guns actually have an empty optic and muzzle slot because I just use attachments from the backpack anyways, and this also gives me two extra spare slots for other attachments. Regarding the attachments themselves, I actually want to go through all of them right here because for how valuable they are, it really is worth doing. Starting with the primary slot, the first two unlocks are kind of meh, but as soon as you get to the SPD reflex, that is top of class. The SPD Reflex is on power with the best regular Reflex sights like the Kemper sight or the Red Dot sight, but it doesn't take up an attachment slot. The spotting sight is also decent, not because of auto spotting but because it is a good sight. It has clean crosshairs and a decent field of view compared to other sights with the same zoom level. The 3x thermal sight at the very end is also quite good, but on anything other than sniper rifles, you're probably better off with the T2M offset which offers less zoom but faster ADS. Speaking of secondary sights, again the first two are terrible. I swear it's like they're doing this on purpose to push you away from the backpack in general before you reach any of the good stuff, because again, the T2M offset, which is the third unlock, is top of class. Moving on to the underbarrel slot, there are only two options here. The grenade launcher can be useful against both infantry and vehicles, but only in some rare situations. It's certainly not viable as a primary weapon, but you can take it off immediately after using it, so you don't suffer the ADS penalty when you're not using it. I don't see much in the shotgun. You could give it a try, but when I did, I put it away immediately afterwards. Moving on to the muzzle slot. Both suppressors are excellent. They reduce recoil on one axis without increasing recoil on another, and they also don't affect ADS time, and that makes them quite special in the context of this game because other recoil attachments will have at least one of those drawbacks. And on top of that, these suppressors also give you sound suppression, unlike the other recoil attachments. Just like the SPD Reflex and the T2M Offset, these suppressors are another set of attachments that are top of class, and despite that does not take up any attachment slots because they're from the backpack. It's overall pretty awesome. They do reduce muzzle velocity though, so think twice before using them on long range weapons, but they're essentially a no brainer for other weapons. I typically use the combo suppressor because as discussed earlier, horizontal recoil is usually more important. And that's everything there is to say about the backpack, which is also the last piece in the puzzle that is the sophisticated World War III loadout system. To be totally honest, I don't think the current implementation of the backpack is final, and it's probably subject to change. It's probably the one thing in this video that's almost certainly going to change before this game hits version 1.0. If you're watching this in the far future and it's obvious that something did change, please scroll down and read my pinned comment in the comment section. 
I'll probably address it there along with other things that might have changed. The reason why I think something is going to change is because if you're not thinking this already, uh, I think the current backpack system is so overpowered. This has got to be the end guys, thank you so much for sticking with me this far. I was hoping to include another bit explaining some good loadouts for beginners, informed by everything I already covered, but this video is already approaching 30 minutes in length, so that'll have to be a separate video. This video itself was supposed to be shorter, but I kept finding more things to say and extending the script. I hope this video contained enough useful insight to justify its length. Please let me know how I did, leave a comment if you have any thoughts whatsoever, if you made it to the end, your insight is highly valued. Also, consider subscribing for more World War 3 content. There's that beginner's loadout video, and then I have plans to do a weapons tier list and a strike tier list, followed by more specific topics. I won't bombard your subscription box with news content or random gameplay. I want to specialize in World War 3 content that's dense and useful. Anyways, thanks again for watching and have a great day.